Hello. Welcome to a GibbsCam demonstration from Midwest Cam Solutions. This demonstration is for an advanced mill hog out part from a solid model. We're going to start out again and open up a solid model. This model is going to be a pair of solid file type. It's going to be this little lever hog out. I'm going to open that up. I'll replace the one I had. It's going to be a three axis vertical mill. And it brings in my part model. Now, I can look at the model and see how it's orientated. We don't have to align the face because it looks like it's sitting in the right direction. We'll do this side. But I might want to rotate it to maximize my sod stock uh, size I'll need. Let's go to Modify 2D Rotate. I'm going to rotate by degrees clockwise. And if I do a shrink wrap, Control Tilde is a shortcut. Undo that. Let me go um, 2 degrees. And shrink wrap it. I want to make sure that my 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 orientation of it is going to be as small as it can be for rectangular size. That looks like a pretty good spot there. And if we did want to move the part origin, we can move part origin either by clicking on a face. You know, Alt click will give us the face depth or side. We're turning the profiler on. We can slide this in to see the shapes clear. And if I Alt Shift click this hole. We can put it to there, but maybe having the Z at zero. This will move that origin out of this hole. Or we can move it back over here and keep it to zero on the top. So using a profiler to move origins or faces uh, or geometry elements is pretty easy. And when you do that, it does update your stock dimensions. Now my stock dimensions, I'm going to add maybe 100,000 stock around the perimeter. That will be the uh, sock cut. Uh, condition. So I'm just going to increase a little bit of size to everything here. I'll add a little bit of stock on the top for face milling. And we're going to start with a uh, minus 1.5 thick part. So I'll be gripping it in a vise and having extra stock underneath to hold on to it. Next we'll go to uh, tools and cam. Let's say I want to fly cut the top. Well, we can go to the processes. I'm going to be in my tool crib library. And grab maybe just a face mill, a two inch face mill that will just zigzag on the part. If I say do it, it just fly cutted the part. Um, hit CPR and you know it cuts it. Uh, in the process, we can tell it to do different styles of face milling. This is the strategy face milling, the depth, speeds, and feeds. Start corner, if I do a one direction, then redo, it starts over here and goes one direction. Now I might want to have my uh, part uh, have a bigger cut width, maybe an inch and a half, and say redo. I might want to take my tool and make it maybe a three inch face mill, and say redo. So as I change my tool, it updates a cut width to the last ratio proportion associated with the last usage. Pretty sweet thing. You do have back and forth, which always maintains climb cutting, zigzag, or spiraling and your clearance for it lands. Well, we'll use that for my face milling cycle. And you could save this face milling cycle and never have to predefine it again. And if you do want to see it in a tool holder, you could always pop it into a holder, tell it to stick out from the holder, and uh, rewind play, turn the tool holder on, and you can see that holder as well. So it's easy to see those holders and, and also do collision detection for fixtures and whatnot as well. Well, now let's create a tool for roughing. I'm going to use a big one inch Rougher, be a one inch end mill for flute. So we give it some flute length, longer tool, sticking out a couple inches out of the holder. Maybe it's just a high speed steel tool. And I'm going to take this tool and I'm going to use the advanced 3D machining to do pocketing. There are 12 strategies in this module pocketing, the depth of cut. I want it just to machine. Let me move my uh, part over here down to this level. So if we click here, I'll click there, it tells me how deep that is. I'm going to take it maybe uh, 0.375 uh, steps, um, speeds and feeds, and leave stock, maybe 10 thousandths. And core detection is outside in roughing, so it goes outside in, side cutting, and I like arcs, so I get nice clean G2, G3, G code. And um, this was going to be cutting from a um, a stock mounted box, so I'll put my workpiece default 
and go to stock model box and those my stock condition. Simply just select the whole model and say do it. Now as it's calculating this, it goes to the task manager, but I could be configuring my next operation or whatever, you don't have to wait. What's really sweet about this advanced 3D roughing is that we never get sharp turns. They're all nice smooth corners, uh, all G2 and 3 uh, type G code. We also have the repositioning in a high feed mode. So maybe I'll go 400 inches because all these retract modes are going to be advancing in a high feed rate. And in the vertical retracts that we're doing, minimal verticals, this is a number it shows on its own from the tool, but it actually doesn't jump out only where it needs to to get to the next cut. So it doesn't waste paths and cut more air each time it advances. But when it is in a high feed mode, the runtime would be exactly you know what it would take to cut that. If I want to see the holder, I can just hide that as well. So here's doing all the nice side cutting, uh, smooth cuts, keeping the tool tight to the part, and uh, working areas locally. We have depth first on, so it's going to take these areas down first, and kind of rough out my part. And very good. Now, what I would like to do though, when I rough this, this step here. Um, even though in my depth here, in my depth of cut, this value here, I'm going to do a plus 10 pow, which is going to put it at where the actually tool would be for that cut. Because this then will cut right down to that ledge and finish that cut. I'll re render it again. There we go. That's what I wanted. So this kind of just roughs the part out. It's not really going around cutting all my stock around the outside. I'm going to adjust my boundary to go past the stock. I do have extra stock of 0.1. I'll redo it. Now this will allow it to really clean up the whole perimeter of the part and allowing leaving that 10,000 stock on the outside as well. So now it's going to do core detection and it's going around the whole side so now it's going to be cleaning out the whole entire part. Uh, with this advanced roughing, you can actually push your tool faster because you get nice smooth round corner moves and whatnot. Now I'll create a finish tool. Um, finish tool, maybe a 750 diameter finisher. And um, we do have some fillets in here. I'm going to go check the size of those. It's going to be a uh, 375. So 750 was a good guess and that, that'll work just fine. I'm just going to grab this and say I want to contour with it. My depth of cut is going to be down to this step. We'll take it maybe one pass, speeds and feeds, and uh, we'll leave stock to maybe ten thousandths. Do a little arc in and line in, and we're good to go. Now we can just turn the profiler on. This green grid comes up. It's an interactive feature recognition tool that allows me to slide this into my, my shape. And in the process, we have the stay in stock, which I usually use all the time and it'll trim the tool path to the stock condition. So if I say start on this feature, that line, start way out here somewhere, and just come around this corner and then just pass that tangency there and say do that. Even though we're telling it to start out here, it's trimming the stock to here and so it doesn't cut any air. Um, and in my stock conditions here, I want zero. I knew there wasn't stock there because I was seeing these color shades which means that it wasn't, uh, you know, was it the same as my roughing. When you do make these simple little, uh, you know, unforgiving little things, just a couple of clicks and straightens it right out. So here comes my tool now. It positions. I already did it here. Rewind play. And if I want to stop here to really, you know, see something, I can use op stop. And tell it to stop at operation three. So now I'll rewind and play. We'll let it render through, and I'll be able to stop the tool without having to tell it. So you can go full blast. It stops the beginning tool three, single block. This is where it trims it to my stock condition, comes in, and then starts doing my finished little profile cut. and goes around and cuts that. So we're done there. Next thing is, I might want to uh, maybe cut this little pocket here. And again, I need to know maybe a little information from it. You can use the profiler, though to create tools from. So if I bring this up to this area, open a tool up, say I want to finish end mill, I'll click on that little green circle, it's 0.42. 
versus using show position, so it's a little, a little easier and faster. We use maybe a 375 diameter tool. Now I'll finish this little cavity. I'm just going to use the standard Gibbs roughing, and uh, we're going to use offset pocketing. My step over is going to be half the tool, and my depth of cut is going to be this deep. We'll take it one pass. We'll do a ramp in, so it just ramps it in, and speeds and feeds for this guy. Um, and maybe leave a little stock and put another same tool or a different tool behind it, and this will be zero stock, and I'll speed it up because the material library knows when you're just doing finished XY cuts, it ups the uh, surface foot and chip load for you, depending on your tool type. So you do it there, and now it ramps it in and cuts that out. No problem. That's good. And uh, we're ready to go. Now, um, you know, I showed you the um, hole manager before, but if you wanted to just dry something, you could say, well, I want to drill. You can click on the drill size. I'll click the circle from the profiler. It's a 312 hole. Because users can you know, have all the control in the world. You can say, oh, I just want to take this tool and drill a hole with it. The depth of cut, if I alt click in this hole, that's where it breaks through here. And you could ask, add a little bit to it to assure breakthrough or the depth you need it, speeds and feeds. And um, just select the holes that you'd want to drill. We could click these holes. Actually, it looks like that's the only hole that is that size. And say so do it. So you could use the uh, profiler for drilling holes, or you could use the hole manager. I think I'm going to use the hole manager because it just speeds everything up so much more. And uh, to use hole manager, model must be selected. Go to the hole manager, we're going to run EFR. And again, it creates a work group. We'll call it holes. My defaults are in. This window can be opened also. You can see all the attributes of the feature. Because what, what the um, attributes are, are these little symbols. The crosshair is the top of the part, so we know exactly where the R plane would be. If it's a through hole, it's got a, just a dot. If it's a blind hole, it's got a little line through it. Um, so we can see all those entity types right there. I'm just going to auto group them, make process parameter groups. So now we're ready to go. Now if I double click one of these groups, these are these holes. This is this hole. Now the dot here is on the top because this hole's got a counterbore, a big countersink on the bottom. Now if I want to maybe reverse that and drill it here and just get it done while I'm here and countersink it on a drill press, you can just reverse the direction. So now we have this reverse direction and, and this hole is just a single hole, it's its own entity. We go to the hole wizard and uh, it's telling me I need a 41 degree tool. Now I haven't put in the chamfer sizes yet in my preferences when I installed this product, this software. So if I go to preferences, and go to machining preferences to hole wizard hole data and in my create tool menu I can say you know what we might use 80 uh, the chamfers could be you know 41 someday we can add that we might use 120 on some parts I could put a 60 in there and add that so in my uh, tool creation we got a, a 40 and a uh, 41 let me put that 60 in there I didn't hit the button and in my drills, we have an 18 and one eight and then 180, but I might use 135 sometimes, so I'll add that as well. So now by adding this to the data, if I go back to my um, hole manager again, and we're going to do this group, hit hole wizard, now it knows there's a 41 chamfer. So it will select the right chamfer sizes as long as they're available in your settings. And then this is the size of the chamfer. Now because it's on the bottom, I'm not going to spot it. I'm just going to drill it. So I can say next, we need to create a drill, and next build that process and build that operation. And that's going to come in there and you know put that hole in there. Uh, I can turn my op stop back off. Okay, so we'll go back to the next group. Now this group here is a hole. Now these holes may be a tapped hole. I'm just going to edit the type and say this is a tapped hole. Now when I go to hole wizard, we have a threaded hole. This is a, a 40 TPI. Well, it could be possibly maybe a 440. Now this table of thread data is accessed right here where you can create your own thread libraries for helical threads or custom threads and easily just grab them from this menu. Um, I want to spot it, thrill it, not drill chamfer, tap it, and rigid tap it. Um, and I'll use a 45 degree chamfer tool. And uh, we just say next. Well, we need a spot drill, a drill, and a tap. Next, build that process 
and build the operations. Now what's nice about the hole manager in the hole wizard is that it knows where to put the airplane, where the surface is. So it puts all the proper data in to keep me, uh, you know, efficient as possible without having to type all this data. These holes here are bolt circles. So we can go to hole wizard and say, okay, this is a bolt circle. Let's just drill it and spot face it. I'll say next, I need a drill and a spot face tool. Next, build a process, deselect the others, and do that. So that's done now. Then we have these other holes. So these holes are those two holes. So I'll go to hole wizard. Maybe we'll just drill those. Drill it. Create the drill. Next, build that. De deselect my old process operation and do that one. So we're moving right along. So we have pretty much the holes in now. So holes are really fast with hole manager and the responsibility for typing is very, very limited. And you can do multiple, you know, R planes and vary the R with the feature, different R planes, vary the depths with the feature. So it does multi-level drilling. One process takes care of all the holes in the entire part. We do have one more hole here. So let me go back to a uh, hole manager and uh, that's that hole here. Now this is a big drilled hole. So the hole wizard, it's a this size drill. You know, I might want to ream that or bore that. So I'm going to go to edit. I'm just going to create a reamer. Now I'm going to go to hole wizard. We're creating a reamed hole. Um, I'll identify my pre-dried hole, pre-drilled hole size. I'll use um, the size of the drill. Drill it and finish ream it. Next, we need a drill and a reamer. It creates them. Next, builds the process. Deselects my ops. Builds that operation. So that big hole's done. Now, if I wanted to, you know, anytime I double click an operation that uses the hole manager, it goes back to the wizard. And you can go back, back, and you can change things. You can also increase sizes right here. You also have the liberty to open up a hole wizard process and open up my, uh, my, uh, my drilled hole here. And if I want it to go deeper, I can type in a deeper number and just redo it. So now it's a process. If I want to go all the way through my stock, which is an inch and a half, we could type that in, redo it. So now we got a lot of clearance in there. So when my, when my reamer goes in there, um, we'll have more uh, stuff for the chips and stuff to fall out. So that's what it would look like. This is a reamer area. That's a pre-drilled hole area. Moving right along. Now let's create another tool for this little cut right here, this little radius that we have right there. And I would use the show position to determine the curvature of that. It's a 0.5 radius. So here we'd make a ball in mill. It's a one inch. And uh, that's good. These little processes, we can discard those. Grab this guy. I'm going to contour now. Well, the surface that we're cutting is from here, and the depth's going to be that. Uh, speeds and feeds from a 1 inch M mill zero stock. Now, I'm going to use some geometry to cut this. So I'm just going to select the top face, go to my geometry uh, work group. And if I wanted to make a new work group for it, too, just for aid of the machine, we're going to say mill raid. Um, mill raid, we'll just call that. And if I Extract geometry off that face. It gives me all the geometry on that face. Now I want to start cutting here, this side, that direction. I'm going to start off my part over here. Uh, let me undo that. Because this is a parametric model, I'm going to put a tolerance in here. That way I'll get nice circles and stuff for my labels because there was a spline before. I'm going to cut here, this direction, start out here. We're going to end on this feature right here and just end off my part and say, do that. It puts that tool path in. Now we're going to cut here, this direction, start out here. I'm going to end on this feature. Oh, I put the wrong choice. One second. Start here, right click, and end here. I had start there before. And come out here so we have a sharp corner there and do that cut. And then start here, this side. Start out here, right click, end here, end out here, and do that. Now how easy is that? It's like uh, giving a map to grannies. Real simple to program parts with the Gips Camp. Parts pretty much done now. Um, we got uh, everything all machined on it. So now we can, you know, post it, make code like we've done in some of the other examples. We can also analyze the cut part and compare it to the solid model. So if I select the model, go to CPR, you can analyze cut part. Analyzing cut part allows us to check any remaining material that may be on the part. And when you see this blue shading where it's kind of gray and uh, I mean uh, kind of hatching kind of colors, that means it's intolerance and it's and it's good. Undercut on a cut part would show any violations. 
So if I did violate anything, you would see it in red as far as the, the value. It looks like my chamfer went a little deeper. That might have been a 41 that it said, but I put a 45 in there. So it told me I had a little deviation there. But by running these, these analyze tools, you never really make a bad part. Um, of course, what you see is what you get, but analyzing it compares the solid models to the cutting, and it really helps us out a whole great deal. And we can run all the reporters, the tool lists, and everything, set them up in a directory file for the guys in the shop, get the code, we're pretty much done with the part. The operation summary gives me my runtime. You can see where most of the time is spent. Of course, this roughing operation is 16 minutes. I might want to go back and readdress that. So if I go back up to operation 2, and make this uh, tool that we're using, carbide tool, or maybe it's an insert tool, in my process, RPM speeds and feeds, and just redo it. So now we got a, uh, a better runtime here with the carbide tool versus high speed still. What's nice about this run report is you can look and see what you get when you're done, and then choose to, to try different things and see what the results will be. Um, there we go. We're kind of done with this part, and I think this completes a little demonstration of a, a more advanced uh, milling part from a solid. Hope you enjoyed the presentation, and thank you very much. Have a great day.